All right, so let's get started then. Today we're going to be talking about blood pressure and its regulation. I've been getting a number of questions um, concerning this topic, so I figure, you know what, we need to address this. This is something that people are asking about, so if you guys are asking about it, I want to make sure uh, that we cover that topic. Now, I just also want to mention that when I do post this video in the members area, I'm also going to include a number of additional videos that I've made on the topic of blood pressure and its regulation. So when I send you that information, the links to the videos with the resources, I will be also including additional videos that I think can help enhance your understanding of the topic of blood pressure and its regulation. So the first thing I want to do, this is kind of going into starting with the basics. What is blood pressure? And I like to start out with an analogy because it helps me to remember things and understand things better. And this analogy, unfortunately for the recipient, has to do with a child and water balloons. Now, you know about these water balloons. We fill them with water and then we throw them at people and then it hits people and it kind of explodes and they get wet. Well, the thing that's inside of the balloon is water. And because there's water in the balloon, it is going to be the water is going to be applying pressure. It's going to be applying a force to the walls of the balloon. Now, that being said, um, the more water you have in there, the greater the pressure. Now, that being said, uh, you can fill it with so much water that it pops. And the more water you have on it, when you, when you throw it against something, if you have more water in it, the, 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 the chances that it's going to explode are going to be significantly higher. Anytime you have fluid in a container, whatever that container is, it is going to be exerting pressure on the container itself. And then when we take that and we kind of extend it a little bit and we look at um, a hose, a garden hose, and this is something that I've spoken about in previous videos, but you have a garden hose and this garden hose is going to be connected on one end to a water supply and water is going to be rushing through this water hose trying to get to the other end and of course the, the more you turn up the water, the faster the water is going to be going, the more pressure the water is going to be exerting on that tube. Once again, once you have fluid uh, going through a container or in a container, you're going to have pressure being exerted on the walls of the container. And that is the same for blood and its pressure. You have blood that's being pumped by the heart and the heart is pumping and it's sending the, the blood into the, the, the blood vessels. And as the blood is rushing through those vessels going to their target locations, it is going to be exerting pressure on the wall. Now, taking that, let's look at the definition of blood pressure. According to wikipedia.com or .org, you know how much we love uh, Wikipedia, blood pressure is defined as the pressure exerted by circulating blood upon the walls of blood vessels, and it is one of the principal vital signs. So once again, you have blood that's rushing through these vessels. As, as it's rushing through the vessels, it is exerting pressure on the walls of the blood vessels. And this is going to be one of the principal vital signs. These are one of the things that, you know, you go to the doctor, they take your blood pressure because they want to know if there are any potential uh, issues with your circulatory system, whether they are cardiovascular disorders like hypertension, high blood pressure, um, or other issues that they can detect with this vital sign of blood pressure. Now, how do they measure? It. You go to the doctor and the, the first thing they do is they, they pull out a, an instrument that is called a sphygmomanometer. A sphygmomanometer. It's such a, a, an interesting name, I find. Um, but they use that to be able to determine your blood pressure. So th the way you're going to get that blood pressure uh, is going to be your systolic pressure 
over your diastolic pressure. And the normal range, the normal values that we typically hear would be 120 over 80. And that 120 in millimeters of mercury is giving you the amount of systolic pressure. And that 80 is giving you the diastolic pressure. Okay, so 120 systolic, 80 is diastolic. Systolic is going to be the pressure during contraction. So when the heart is contracting, when the ventricles are contracting so that it can push the blood uh, to the body, uh, that is your systolic pressure, and that's the, the high point. And the low point is going to be during diastole, or your diastolic pressure is going to be during relaxation. So when the heart relaxes, you're not applying as much pressure, so that value is going to be lower. So under 120 over 80, less than that, or 120 over 80 or below, that is considered to be normal unless it gets too low. And I don't have the values in here for um, hypotension, low blood pressure, but that's going to be less than 90 over 60. Now, uh, of course, the big danger that we hear a lot about is hypertension, high blood pressure. Um, and before we even get to hypertension, there is a prehypertensive state, um, which is where, which that that's when the systolic pressure is between 120 to 139, and the diastolic is between 80 and 89. It's not quite hypertension, um, but it is heading in that direction. And then, of course, hypertension is going to be 140 over 90 or above. All right, so these are the typical values um, that you're going to hear when we're talking about normal blood pressure, 120 over 80 or below that. Prehypertension is a little higher and hypertension, 140 over 90 and above. And you use that sphygmomanometer in order to be able to do those blood pressure readings. Now, in order to fully understand blood pressure, we need to talk about how you go about calculating blood pressure. And the formula for calculating blood pressure is going to be blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times peripheral resistance. Or uh, for short, you can say BP is going to be equal to CO times PR. BP is blood pressure, CO is cardiac output, and PR, of course, is your peripheral resistance. All right. So cardiac output. What is cardiac output? It is exactly what it sounds like. It's the amount of, the amount of blood that is being pumped through the body. Um, but we're, we're um, going to be talking about cardiac output in the amount of blood per minute. All right. So uh, the amount of blood per minute that's being ejected from the heart, that is your cardiac output. And your peripheral resistance has to do with the fact that, hey, if you have fluid that is rushing through a tube, it is going to be encountering resistance. There's going to be friction between that fluid and the tube itself. And that's exactly what you see with blood pressure. I'm, I'm going to include a video that goes into more detail about um, these values and how they're calculated and how they're influenced. But I do want to go into some of that um, in this video. So what happens if you increase cardiac output? If you look at this formula, if the right side gets higher, then the left side also has to get higher. So if you increase cardiac output, you are going to increase blood pressure, which makes sense. If more blood is leaving the heart, um, significantly more blood is leaving the heart, then you're going to have significant uh, amount of pressure being exerted on the blood vessels themselves. And peripheral resistance, if that goes up, if you have an artery that is resistant to blood flow, it is, it is, let's say the artery is clogged, it's going to be harder for blood to travel, and that is going to increase, once again, your blood pressure. So let's focus first on cardiac output. As we mentioned, we have a heart. That heart is beating, and as it's beating, it is sending blood out. Um, you can see here we have the pulmonary vessels that are sending blood to the lungs so that it can pick up oxygenate, oxygen, um, get oxygenated, come back to the heart, and then leave from the left side to go to the rest of the body. All right. This is our cardiac output. We're talking about the amount of blood that is leaving per minute. Now, what are what are the factors that are going to increase 
cardiac output. This is important to understand because if you, once again, if you increase the amount of blood that is leaving the heart, you're increasing cardiac output, that is going to cause an increase in blood pressure. And of course, we don't want it to be um, a significant, a huge increase in blood pressure. So here are the factors. Here are some of the factors. Number one, increased venous return. What does that mean? We have blood that's leaving the heart, and then we have blood that's coming back to the heart. And if you increase the amount of blood that's coming back to the heart, the heart is going to contract even more to push more blood out. More blood comes in, you're going to have you're going to want more blood to leave so that you don't get accumulation and build up of pressure and all that fun stuff. All right? So if you increase the amount of blood coming to the heart, you are also going to increase the amount of blood that is leaving. In other words, and this is the next one, you're going to increase the stroke volume. Once again, more blood comes back, the heart is going to contract more to, con to get that, that large amount of blood out. All right, so if you increase stroke volume, you increase venous return, or if you Increase heart rate. Remember I said that cardiac output were, was the amount of blood that is ejected from the heart per minute? Well, if the heart is beating more times a minute, um, then you're going to get more blood leaving, and you're going to have that increased cardiac output, and as a result, increased blood pressure. And then lastly, we have increased sympathetic activity. All right, so... You have your autonomic nervous system, and that autonomic nervous system is going to be regulating blood pressure, heart rate, and um, the contraction of the heart, in addition to a bunch of other processes that are happening in the body that you don't have to think about. Sympathetic activity is always going to be causing, uh, uh, when, when we're dealing with the blood supply and the, the, the cardiac output and blood pressure, it's going to cause an increase in those values. It's going to make the heart contract even more, even stronger, even faster. When you get an adrenaline rush, you're getting an adrenaline rush because adrenaline is being released. And when adrenaline is released, that causes the heart to beat faster. It causes the heart to beat stronger. In other words, it is causing an increased cardiac output. And a result, if you have an increased cardiac output, you're going to have and increase blood pressure. Okay, so let's then talk about the factors that are going to cause a decrease in cardiac output. Well, it's going to be the exact opposite. If you decrease the amount of blood that's coming back to the heart, so in decreased venous return, that is going to decrease cardiac output. If you decrease your stroke volume, if you decrease your heart rate, or if instead of sympathetic activity, you have the exact opposite, which is your parasympathetic activity, you're going to be slowing down the heart rate. You're going to be slowing the, or decreasing the, the contractility of the heart. So there's going to be a decreased stroke volume and so on and so forth. All right. So the key thing here is if you affect cardiac output, whether you're increasing it by the factors that we spoke about before or you're decreasing it by the factors that we are speaking about now, that is going to cause a change in blood pressure. So that's cardiac output. But we have another factor. That other factor is your peripheral resistance. How do we influence peripheral resistance? Now, when I talk about peripheral resistance, I'm talking about the total resistance to blood flow. Once again, fluid going through a tube, there's going to be resistance. There's going to be friction. You have cells that are going to be bumping into the walls, bumping into each other, and so on, and there's going to be resistance to blood flow. How do we influence that? Number one, systemic vasoconstriction. What that means is the blood vessels themselves, the arteries, the arterioles, I can call, cause them to constrict, and when they constrict, they're going to be narrower. Now, is it easier to get a lot of fluid through a narrow tube or a large tube? Of course, you're going to see a large tube. And what we're doing here is we're making the tubes narrower. And because we're making it narrower, it's going to be harder for blood to travel. And of course, of course, if you go to an extreme and you completely close it off, that is 
as much vasoconstriction as you can get. And as a result of that, um, the peripheral resistance is going to be infinitely high. All right. So systemic vasoconstriction, this is going to be a result of increased sympathetic activity. So the sympathetic activity, the adrenaline, the norepinephrine that we were talking about before, that's causing an increase in cardiac output, that is also causing an increase in vasoconstriction. And as a result of that, an increase in peripheral resistance. And as a result of that, we're increasing blood pressure. But then you have the opposite. We can go in the opposite direction. If you have systemic vasodilation, so now the, 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 the arterioles, the muscle, the smooth muscle layer that's surrounding the arterioles and the arteries are going to relax and it's going to become wider. And if it's wider, that is going to decrease the resistance and that is then going to decrease blood pressure. And with that, you know, we have a decreased sympathetic activity or we also have parasympathetic activity that may have an effect on that. Um, but key thing here, vasoconstriction, vasodilation, we are influencing peripheral resistance. And if we influence peripheral resistance, whether we're increasing or decreasing it, we're going to cause an increase or a decrease in blood pressure. All right, hope that makes sense. Let's move on to actually there was a question that was asked in the Facebook group by Helen Baker. I'm not sure about ba Baker. I'm not sure if it's Helen or Helene, um, but her question was this. What would a difference in blood pressure between the left and right arm indicate? And how can or does high blood pressure damage the body and the cardiovascular system. This is an excellent question and I wanted to deal with it now while I'm doing this presentation because it kind of leads us into this next topic which has to do with, okay, so what's the problem um, with high blood pressure? Why is that such an issue? Doesn't that just mean you have more force taking the blood to the body? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? That's what we're gonna talk about now. First, let's talk about the, the flow of blood. Now, it, blood is leaving the heart, and then it's going to go via the arteries. But from the arteries, it's going to go to the arterioles, and then from the arterioles to the capillaries, from the capillaries to the venules, from the venules to the veins, and from the veins, it's going to go back to the heart. And that's what we're looking at part of that here. This is an arteriole. All right, so here we are. Oops, sorry about that. Here we are coming from... Let's say we have an artery that's coming up here that's leave, leading into this arteriole. So this is my arteriole. And then all of this section here, we are dealing with capillaries. And then here we have our venule. And from our venule, we're going to go back. And I should have done red and blue, but I didn't. We're going to go back ultimately via the veins uh, to the heart. So here we're oxygenated. And on this side, we are deoxygenated. Now, let's look at the diameter of these vessels. Of course, the, the ones that are going to be the largest here on this side are going to be the arteries. But then when you get down to the arterioles, it's going to be, you know, a, a narrower opening. And then when we get down to the arterioles, it's going to be even narrower. And you can see that the walls here, here the walls are thicker. You can see there's significant amount of uh, well, relatively speaking, a significant amount of smooth muscle that's surrounding these vessels. But then when we get to the capillaries, notice that these um, red blood cells are passing through these narrow vessels one at a time. And not just that, the walls, as I was mentioning before, are very thin. So if you have these capillaries, and these are all throughout your tissues, um, the, every blood cell in your body, I mean, every cell in your body is within two blood cell diameters away from capillaries. So we're dealing with a ton of these little tiny vessels. And because of the fact that they're little, they're tiny, they have these thin walls, if you apply too much pressure that can actually damage these walls. And once you start damaging the walls, you start to impair with the you start to impair the blood flow. And once you start impairing the blood flow, 
You're not going to get the nutrients and the oxygen being delivered to the tissues effectively. And then that can cause problems with the tissues. It can cause problems with the organs because they're not getting what they need. So this is actually answering the second question first before answering the first. Um, and we'll get back to that first question. But the main thing I want you to see here is that because these vessels are so tiny, or especially where you have tiny vessels, it can cause damage to those vessels. Once you start damaging those vessels, you can cause other um, significant problems. All right, so that's the first part. The next thing that I want to talk about is the fact that you have many more blood vessels and capillaries in your body, much more um, blood vessel volume than you actually have blood. All right. You have about five liters of blood in your body that's being circulated at one time. Um, it's going to vary from individual to individual, but you have significantly more space in capillaries and blood vessels and all that kind of stuff. So you're not going to have blood going everywhere in the same amounts. All right. So you just finish eating, you want to redirect blood so that it is going to your digestive system so that your, your stomach can do what it needs to do, your intestines need to, can do what they need to do and absorb the nutrients that you just finished breaking down and all that good stuff. When you're running, you want the blood to be um, redirected to the muscles in your legs so that they can get the energy that they need and you don't cramp, all right? In order for that to happen, there needs to be vasoconstriction and vasodilation, vasoconstriction blocking off the blood circulation to the parts that don't need it as much, and vasodilation so that the, the parts that do need it can get it. All right, hope that makes sense. Um, so what would a, a difference between um, blood pressure on the left side and the right side? If you take blood pressure on the left and you take blood pressure on the right, and you notice that there's a significant difference. Now, there, there might be a little bit of difference, and that's not a huge issue, but once you start to get you know, 10, 15 millimeters of mercury difference, that can be an indication. Um, let's say this is on the right side. Let's say this is on the right side. We're simplifying things, of course. If these blood vessels are clogged, if there are compromises to the blood, the, the blood vessels on one side, the blood is not going to flow as well. And if the blood is not going to flow as well, if there's, if there's more resistance, that can cause an increase in blood pressure on one side as opposed to the others. So if there's a difference, a significant difference, that's an indication that there's some kind of a cardiovascular problem um, where there's more more resistance in one place than there is in the other. Um, and that can be due to clogged arteries. It can be due to um, problems, damage to the capillaries. There can be a number of issues that are happening there and further testing would be necessary to be able to determine what that is. So why is hypertension bad? Which is essentially um, the second question that you are asking. Hypertension can lead to what we call arteriosclerosis. If you're beating against the wall of the the walls of the blood vessels, that can cause um, narrowing of those um, blood vessels. It can cause damage to the blood vessel walls. With that, um, we can get atherosclerosis, which is the accumulation of plaque. Once the walls start getting damaged, you can get um, stuff being um, uh, deposited and 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 kind of clogging up the arteries, and that's what we see in this sec second picture here. And then once again, we spoke about the fact that capillaries are very um, thin. They're very susceptible to damage if the pressure is way up there. Um, and because of that, that can cause problems in a number of places. One of the places that we general generally see problems would be with the kidney. All right. We, we know that the kidney is going to be involved in filtering blood. So here we have our renal artery. Okay, and we can see the renal artery here. So we have blood that's going to be entering the renal artery, going to the kidney, um, and then it's going to eventually get into the um, capillaries, the glomerular capillaries. We'll talk about that in more detail when we go into the urinary system and, and so on. Um, but when you get into these really tiny capillaries and these are responsible for filtering the blood, an 
increase in blood pressure, a significant increase in blood pressure can cause damage to these capillaries. Um, so it can cause kidney damage. And of course, with kidney damage, that can lead to an even greater increase in blood pressure. And then you have this vicious cycle that is happening. And of course, that is a negative thing. Some other common places um, that it can affect um, the blood supply to the brain. The brain is extremely active. It uses about 20% of the energy that is produced in the body, even though it's nowhere close to that in mass. Um, so if you have, of course, you have arteries that are leading to the brain, very important, um, supplying nutrients and oxygen and taking away the waste and all that stuff, you can cause damage to the arteries in the brain and that can result in a, in a stroke. All right, a, cer a, a, a cerebrovascular accident or a stroke. And of course, that in and of itself brings a ton of complications. Um, not only that, if you have a higher blood pressure, um, let's say there's increased peripheral resistance, um, the, the heart is going to try to compensate. So we have our heart here. And one of the things that we see as a result of that increased pressure on the vessels is increased pressure on the heart. And the heart can compensate with that um, for that by increasing its contraction. It can cause actually it can actually cause damage to the heart muscle itself. And once you start to damage the heart muscle, then you're going to be compromising circulation even more. All right. So these are some ways um, that hypertension can cause a significant amount of damage. It can cause damage to other um, parts of the body. You have very thin capillaries in your eyes, um, in the retina of your eyes, and that can cause damage to those. It can impair vision. Um, it can impair so many different processes by literally causing damage by that, that pressure that you're exerting on the walls of the capillaries. Now, I want to talk about something else that we were talking about in the Facebook group this week, um, and that's called orthostatic or postural hypertension. And this is something that you sometimes notice in individuals that have a compromised cardio cardiovascular system, where you take the blood pressure when they are laying down, and you take the blood pressure when they are standing up, and you notice that there is a significant drop in that blood pressure. Now, what is the problem there? I mentioned the fact that you have many more blood vessels in your body and capillaries all throughout than you actually have blood volume. And you're going to be constricting a lot of places. There's going to be a significant amount of vasoconstriction so that the blood isn't going to places that don't need it as much or it's not going as much to those places because they don't need them. They don't need the nutrients and the oxygen as much at that time. Now, let's say I'm laying down. And then all of a sudden, I get up. If all of a sudden I get up, we have gravity that's going to be acting on the blood and under the blood, um, the, the cardiovascular system. And that is going to attempt to pull the blood down. And you're going to get a little bit of pooling in the lower extremities. You're going to get a little more blood going down to your legs just because gravity is acting on this. However, the, the cardiovascular system is able to compensate for that and to, to cause then more vasoconstriction in the lower extremities and to increase the amount of blood that's going back to the heart so that we can get blood going other places. This is a reflex response. All right. Now, if the cardiovascular system is compromised and it is not responding as well, you end up with this situation of orthostatic or postural hypotension where you do get a significant amount of pooling in the lower extremities. And once that happens, if it happens to an extreme, of course, you're not getting blood going as well to the brains and to the upper extremities. And of course, if blood is not going to the brain, that can cause a significant amount of issues. And usually what happens in that type of a situation is that individual maybe faints. And why are they fainting? They are fainting because the body is responding in a way to try to make it easier for blood to get to the brain. So it puts you in that um, it puts you in that position where you are basically laying down so that it is easier to get blood to the brain. It's not as much blood pooling in the lower extremities. 
And um, this is an indication that there is a, a problem with the way that the body is responding, the way the cardiovascular system is responding. It's not doing, um, it's not causing vasoconstriction and vasodilation in the way that it's supposed to. And that results in this lower blood pressure in those individuals. Um, and some situations where you might see this is if an individual is dehydrated, and this is what we were talking about in the Facebook group. If that individual is dehydrated, um, they're going to have a lower blood volume. And if you have a lower blood volume, the differences are going to be even more significant. All right, so that is a, an overview of blood pressure and how it is regulated. We spoke a little bit about hypertension, and now we're speaking a little bit about um, a, a orthostatic or postural hypotension, um, and that is the end of the presentation.